I've made a drawing of a barn on a hilltop and I'm brushing in the first wash of raw sienna. While this is wet I'll run some of the other colours of the sky into it. I must tell you straight away that my board is at an angle of nearly 90 degrees and this is the best angle for filming but it's the worst angle for painting watercolours. I'm also sitting a little bit to one side and the best angle for watercolours is about 15 to 20 degrees from the horizontal. I'm using my old filbert brush, hog bristle brush, to indicate some leaves on the tree, dabbing and stippling. It's a very, very convenient way of doing trees in the middle distance. Slightly turn the brush between your fingers as you do given different angles. I've changed to a smaller brush now, a number four. It's an ordinary round brush. And while the washes are still wet, I'm running in some darker colour. I'll soften the edges of some of these with, um, with clear water, creating hard and soft edges. This is very good for skies and for trees. Now I'm painting a bush in front of the building. The purpose of this little demonstration is to show you that it's better to paint the foreground bushes if you're doing a dark building or even a lighter building and then the the colours of the building don't intrude into the the tree or the bush. With a quick sweep I'm doing the grass. I'm using cerulean blue and raw sienna. While it's wet I'm running in some Payne's grey for the shadow areas. Now for the, the chimney stack I'm using alizarin crimson mixed with burnt sienna. The same for the building. Now I've dried that passage with a hairdryer and now I'm doing the shadow side of the building. And this is what uh, I meant earlier on. You can bring the colour up to the, the bush itself and let the, the brush, brush dot around a little bit to give you the rough edge of the, the bush. That mixes light red and ultramarine and before it's dry I'm running in some raw sienna and burnt sienna mixed together for the local colour. Very much the same method for the one behind. But the, the side of the lean-to is also in shadow, so I'll paint that in a moment. Now 
Right, it's almost the same colour, so when I paint it, I'll, I'll lift it out. I'll show you that in a moment, to separate the two areas. This is just a quick demonstration. Now, this is the, I've, I'm just painting this now, and it merges too much with the, the one behind. So I'm going to dry it, and then with a damp brush dampened between my fingers, I'm going to lift out some of the pigment, and that separates the two images. On the lower part, I've, I've done a, a sweeping small landscape with some oast houses, and some useful tips in this particular demonstration. For instance, uh, I'll show you how to paint the conical host house, one method of doing it. I'm painting the side of the building in a negative way, using the trees to define the side of the building, softening the edges in a little bit here and there. dragging the brush to create the image of a distant tree. I've changed my colours a bit now. I'm using cerulean blue in with the ultramarine and raw sienna for a brighter green for the foreground bushes. I've gone back to using the bristle brush for more texture. Once again, one sweep of a, a large number 14 brush. This is a very old sable brush I've got. I don't use sables very much. I prefer a man-made fibre brush. The sable picks up too much pigment. Change to a, a half inch brush for those last sweeps. As you can see, I use a metal palette. I prefer this to china because the paint skitters around on china, and I prefer it to plastic because plastic gets scratched and it's never a very satisfactory surface to mix colours on. I prefer a nice, good quality metal palette that's been enamelled. This one is particularly good because it's got two four-inch wells at the front and two three-inch wells at the back. It's more than enough for a, a big painting. Most of the paintings I do are quarter imperial, which is about 14 by 11, and this is perfectly adequate for that. I'm putting a first wash of burnt sienna into the conical oast houses and introducing a little bit of green at the, the lower margin to stand for moss. And now I've dipped into my shadow mix, which is ultramarine and light red. I'm putting it on the shadow side, and now I'm going to run the two together with a, a richer mix of burnt sienna, creating the illusion of a conical building. Also, the, the colours are all sedimentary colours, and they help to give the illusion of bricks and stones. It's very much the same colours in the roof. Introducing a, some green again at the lower margin. Very rich, full washes. I've just noticed that I haven't drawn the, the other side of the roof line on the other side of the tree, so I'll paint that in. There we go. Now this roof is in shadow, so I'm using ultramarine and light red, which is my standard shadow mix, in a rich, full, fully pigmented wash. But before it's dry, I'll drop in the local colour, which is mostly burnt sienna and allow that to merge freely on the paper. And I'll give the chimney pot the same treatment. Now 
I'll carry on and make the finishing touches to this little demonstration. through the painting doing all the darks and now I'll put some of the shadows in under the eaves. Of course this always helps to make the painting jump when you put the shadows in and give it more of a more dimension. I'm using light red and ultramarine for the shadows. I use that mix all the time and it helps to unify the painting. I make all my purples and my dark brownish purples with it. For this next painting I've chosen an old barn with a, a pond in front and I've made a strong drawing I always favour a strong drawing. And I, in my range of eight colours along the top of the page. I'm brushing in some raw sienna first, towards the middle of the painting, and colour coding the painting by dragging the colour down into the painting itself. Now, the, as I put the colours into the sky, you can see how much the, the paint is running, and that's because the board is almost upright. If you had it at the most the optimum angle of 15 degrees to 20 degrees, it would run slower and you can control it better. So I have to work rather fast for this. I've dried the brush between my fingers and I'm taking off some of the pigment and forming the clouds. And I'll do this process again in a moment, taking off the surplus paint. I'm dragging some of the same colour in for the first washes into the pond. I've used some masking fluid in this painting, you'll see it later on. While the sky's wet, we can keep adding pigment, but once the drying process starts, you must leave it alone. Otherwise you'll get nasty run backs. Now the sky's dried, very much lighter as you can see. And I'm stippling in the tree behind the building. I allowed it to dry too much so the scratching wasn't very effective there. But I'll probably show you that later on again in a, a later demonstration. I'm using a much wetter mix for this second tree. So I'm getting rather larger blobs changing the angle between my fingers as I, as I dab it on. If you'll notice the fence below the tree has been painted with masking fluid. So I can go right over that.
putting some darks into it and allowing it to merge wet into wet. This will be com particularly effective against the, the fence when it's rubbed off afterwards. Now I'm using a different method to paint the tree over this side, dragging the brush almost horizontally to the paper, allowing the brush to touch the surface of the paper and skitter around and form the tree shapes. This is a freer way of working than using the hog bristle brush. And it's nice to introduce a number of methods into a painting. Give it variety. It's a number six Martin Good brush. It's a mixture of nylon and sable. Mostly nylon, just a touch of sable. Now that's wet enough for me to actually scratch the surface. Pushing the paint away. Before it's dry, I continue for a counter change effect. Continue putting some little branches in, going from light to dark. Now I'm enhancing some of the areas in between the portions that I scratched, helping to make the illusion of branches and twigs and trunks. The first wash was mostly light red and now I'm introducing a mixture of raw sienna and, uh, and ultramarine to the lower margin of the roof to suggest moss. That second wash ran back into the first one causing it to blossom and this is very effective. It was an accident but you make use of these accidents if you can in watercolour. It's part of the ambiance of watercolour. Is that things happen that you can't always control and you make the most of them. I'm adding a little bit of texturing, some little marks on the, on the roof to suggest staining. Now I'm laying the brush flat to suggest corrugated roof and I'm using cerulean blue and a touch of Payne's grey. Now just some clean water to This is the shadow side of the roof. So my first wash, as is my usual method, is to add ultramarine and light red. But before that's dry, I'll pop in some local colour and allow it to mix freely on the paper surface. Same colour on the other side of the roof. This first wash on, on to suggest stones is raw sienna and before that's dry I'm dropping in other colours, all the dirty colours from the palette. If you add contrasting colours like um, ultramarine, you, they grey down when they touch the, the browns and yellows. Now I'm putting in the local colour of this barn, which is a greenish colour, dull olive green colour, ultramarine and raw sienna, painting over the, the old gate which is leaning against the building, which has been, which has been covered with masking fluid. Now the shadow side of the lean-to, ultramarine and light red again. Putting some figuring into the, the corrugated roof. Just little touches to suggest it is a corrugated roof. 
Now, using the same colour, I'm painting the window frames very simply. The whole painting is very simple. This is a 10 by 12 painting on Bockingford paper, which is a type of roughish knot surface with a very pleasant patina, which is excellent for watercolour, which it's made for, and very good for drawing on as well. I often do pen and wash drawings, and this surface is absolutely perfect for that, giving it a nice tooth. Going on in a simple way, adding the window panes and the shadows. This is raw sienna and burnt sienna mixed together for the door. And I'm also highlighting some of the other woodwork. Painting most of this with a number six brush. Very useful. dragging the brush across the path to create the textures. I'm now mixing up some more colours. This is um, raw sienna and some cerulean blue. Raw sienna again into the dirty mix and adding some lemon yellow and ultramarine for an olive dark greyish green. I'm brightening it up with some more sienna. Now using the bristle brush, I'm painting the grasses in in a rough and ready way. adding in further washes, darker washes of ultramarine and light red to suggest the shadow and um, texture of the grass. And now I'm dampening the, the lower part of the painting for the pond. It's rather a busy scene above and I'm going to paint this as a gentle disturbed water all wet into wet and quite soft. The downward strokes suggest the, the reflections in the pond and the horizontal strokes, the surface textures. Keep adding pigment while the surface is damp, but you've got to stop once it starts to dry. It's beginning to run back on me a little bit, and now I'm putting the finishing touches on, the actual shadows. There's a nice cast shadow there, rather an important one. You'll remember that uh, fences or gate post is covered with masking fluid which I'll remove soon. And the cast shadow from the, the roof and the building itself all helps to give the painting form. Once you put the shadow in, it's a good idea to pop some of the local colour into it. Now I'm just lifting the colour of that roof by putting on a wash of burnt sienna. 
unifying it by doing the same on the other side. Putting a bit of colour into the path. I'm also putting some further washes into the grass to unify the grass. It's rather a dark, sombre painting, and you can't leave areas too light. It's got to harmonise. I've dried all the painting now, and I'm rubbing off the pencil marks, and at the same time, I'll rub off the masking fluid. Oh, that looks lovely and stark and white against the building. But also, in front of the building itself, I put some masking fluid to suggest a pile of rocks. I'm now taking the edge off this by putting some shadows in with ultramarine and light red. This is a bit too startling white at the moment. I've cleaned my palette. I'm very fastidious about this. I like a clean palette and lots of times during a painting I'll stop, spray the palette and clean it with kitchen towels. This is another demonstration of a, a group of buildings just after a storm. So there's lots of rain, flood water on the ground. It's a dark, sombre sky, threatening to rain again. Put this mix of lemon yellow and raw sienna into the middle of it to create a glow. I'm now running the colours together in the sky, making it look like a squall. These colours will dry very much lighter, of course. I've dried the brush between my fingers and now I'm dragging in some little cloud shapes. The sky is now dry. The painting is still slightly damp. So my first washes will diffuse slightly. keeping the pigment dark and quite a strong mix so it doesn't diffuse too much. running more pigment into the mix and while it's wet it'll merge. I'm now using a dry brush method to paint the tree behind this cottage in the distance. As you can see by the little information box I'm holding the brush almost flat against the surface of the paper and painting the side of the building in a negative manner using the tree to do the painting. A very useful ploy Excellent counter change when you do this. It's the play of the light against the darks which make watercolour successful. 
one of the reasons anyway. My brushes are cut down to six inches and the edges have been sharpened so I can flip over the, the brush and scratch the surface. You see me do this when I do trees. You get the sort of mark that it's impossible to, to do with a brush when you use the other end of the brush. Popping in some darks for the shadow side. They're most effective when they're against the lighter part of the sky. And now, painting this much lighter in a greyish colour, cerulean blue, touch of Payne's grey. I'm dropping in some darker colour to suggest a reflection from the patch of cloud above. get this sort of reflection if the, the roof is still wet. Same sort of thing under the chimney stack on the right. I'm making this roof much darker so it stands out against the warm yellow background. Putting some more colour into the chimney stack to make it even darker. Use ultramarine, light red for that, that roof. This painting is also about 10 by 12. Once again, ultramarine and light red, which I'm going to soften at the lower margin of this, this building. Trying to create interest by changing each surface a little, making it a slightly different colour. painting the shadow side of the buildings, putting lots of the, the local colour into the ultramarine and light red mix. And now popping in touches of lighter colours and making a pass across all the windows. Using Payne's grey and ultramarine for the darks. Painting the figure in silhouette against the background. I'm 
And then I'll make a good pass putting all the shadows in. As before, I'm using my mix, my standard mix of ultramarine and light red. And this helps to unify a painting. It's a transparent mix and the colour underneath shows through. I'm using the same colours in the, in the reflections. As you can see, the pencil marks are just a guideline and I usually rub those out afterwards. I hope you've enjoyed the selection of demonstrations I've made on this video. Perhaps you'd like to look over my shoulder while I make the finishing touches.